graduated, elevated. Now's my time to shine, yeah, let's go. Major moves, power moves, take it to the top one time, non stop. Hello and welcome, Dr. Jude Okole. How are you today? I'm good, and you? I am very well, thank you. So, the reason why we're having this chat today um, is basically to help those that have been working throughout the pandemic, be it through research, um, teaching, or just sleeping, you know, because that's work as well. Yep. Sleeping is a job. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just basically to, to pick your brains um, in terms of advice, the challenges that you faced, and, you know, we don't know what's going to happen next year. Yeah. Um, we've got Omicron at the moment, and those challenges, they challenge the way we conduct our research. For some of us, we need to sit down with people, and that's a huge challenge. I mean, Microsoft Teams is great, and we've got Zoom, we've got so many platforms, but it's not the same as a one-to-one -one basis. Yep. So, based on your reflection, uh, in terms of the start of the pandemic, and to where we are now, what has been the greatest challenge um, in terms of teaching and interacting with students like myself? Okay, that's a very good question. <laughs> so to start, um, let me start with teaching. Uh -huh. um, there's been a lot of challenges. Sometimes students message you and then they tell you that, sorry, I can't make it today because I have cold or I have cough. Mm -hmm. or sometimes students just tell you I'm sick I want to stay at home right and yeah. we also have some students where they don't want to mingle with people they just want online so um, teaching has been really challenging because it's no more in person it's now hybrid mm -hmm. hybrid in the sense that um, some students that don't want to come to class can join on zoom or webex why some can um, just come to class. With that being said, um, it's very hard to be in a class where you're trying to satisfy those that are at home listening from the computer and those in class, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's one challenge that we are still trying to navigate through. Um, the other challenge, which I find really serious, is um, the issue of teaching with marks on. Okay. Yeah, so um, I taught a couple of classes this time, and then throughout all those classes, I have to put my marks on. So speaking, and then you have your marks on, sometimes difficulty breathing, or sometimes the student don't even hear you because you have masks like covering your face. So that's another challenge. Um, finally, it's very hard to establish that connection because you're putting the marks on, the students are putting the marks on, that connection that we have in person, we miss it. So these are the challenges on the instructor part. But now let's go to the student challenges. Of course, it's two way. The students have their own issues they're facing, the instructor have their own issues, right? Um, regarding the student challenges, um, I've had some students come to me and say, um, because of this COVID thing, I cannot have group discussions with my class members again, and I don't study alone. I like studying in group now. No one wants to mingle in groups, and it's like a problem. And some students say, my families are getting sick, and everyone is getting COVID, I'm depressed. So depression issue is also very real, right? These are the can, ones that- Can I just interject? Go okay. back to the student or students yeah. that have come to you and have said, well, I prefer to work in groups. What do they expect you to do to, to bring people to their home that have had their COVID test? Like that doesn't make sense. If, if you're conducting research, you should be able to think, okay, everything is now online. Why don't they join um, Zoom PhD groups or postdoc groups? Like, I don't understand. <laughs> You're right, but you also have to remember that some people don't do well with this online conversation. Some people just miss that physical interaction, like physical interaction where you could sit down together, talk over coffee, sit down together, look at this together. Not everyone is used to that online, so but we're getting used to it, right? <laughs> we're having um, coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, <laughs> you might be surprised that um, 
students generally, as an instructor, they feel that you can solve all their problems. Okay. Which is so do problem. you think that is the problem that we believe that you can solve all our problems? Even That's though we've embarked on a journey to be a scientist, where that, we know that it's a lonely path, but you do collaborate and stuff, but we that, know that it's a one-man band. Do you think that, that's a problem? Um, to an extent, but I mean, I would say it's a problem because um, you can't just think, oh, because he's a researcher and he knows everything, he could solve your problem, right? We are humans ourselves and then, um, we are also adjusting to the situation, the environment, right? But to an extent, I always tell my student that to the best of my ability, I will try to help you if I can. Like if they come to me, surprisingly, I'm not like a psychiatric or a, a mental health um, doctor, but if they come to me with issues like I am getting depressed or I'm losing focus, I do the needful, I refer them to, um, the university has like um, resources for that. You have the peer health group. Um, you have the university um, psychiatric. You have um, the counselor that could help them. So as an instructor, I know that they are lost. So they came to me and I'm going to direct them to the appropriate authorities to help them. Um, with that being said, I also um, try to make accommodations for students facing different challenges. Like some students message me and say, I am very sick. I couldn't complete this assignment in time because I'm very sick. I understand that. I could tell them, okay, I'm going to give you one week extension. You get that? So in my part, I'm doing my best to accommodate and help them. In, I'm also doing my best to show them the way to get the resources they need to find help. I mean, I appreciate them coming to me because coming to me means they really trust my judgment, right? So I really appreciate that. Okay, so to flip that over then, um, we've, we've, we've looked at the, the students coming to you. Yeah. You yourself, you're a human being. Exactly. And what that means is, you know, the same afflictions that the student faces, specifically yeah. with COVID-19, it's the same that you will face. So how have you navigated your emotions, feelings, and current reality and previous reality during this period how have you managed it all well um like you said myself i'm human being right and i face challenges too so um what did i do sometimes when i face issues like maybe getting frustrated or maybe just looking at the issue of marks and i seek for help also i talk to people right i talk to people that know that they are they are higher than me in authority I also have mentors, right? I have people I speak to. I tell them, how are you dealing with these challenges? And they give me tips. And those tips really help. And um, as a researcher and also maybe an instructor, um, I take a lot of online courses. Mm -hmm. um, like there's so many free online courses. I just think like recently I took one on um, navigating through COVID period as an instructor. Okay. Um, and it helped me get tips like how to manage classroom, how to manage stress, how to manage student complaints. Um, so I just didn't, don't sit down and say, okay, I'm going to leave with it. No, I seek for help myself because mm -hmm. you can only help people when you help yourself. Um, so I don't just sit down, I seek for help and it's really been helpful. It's not easy. Honestly, it's not easy. With research, with teaching, it's not easy. And I can't say it's going to get easier because with this new variant coming out and then um, people getting sick again and the numbers going up, but we still have to live with it. We can't just shut down teaching and research because it's a major part of our lives, but I'm seeking help also and it's been going on fine. So in terms of the, the students then, as we were talking, we realized that they all deal with issues differently. Some may be in front, some may be in the middle, some may be at the back. How do you then navigate the challenges? Because it seems as if with COVID-19, it's not getting any better. And yep. there may be another outbreak. 
what advice do you have for those students who move a bit slow? Because then we need to catch on with the roller coaster, really, for everything to move in a synchronized manner that's peaceful to you in terms of dealing with the marking, the teaching, and time management. What you know? What are your thoughts around that? Well, um, I would tell the student first of all to keep doing their best um, and not to compare themselves with others because we are all different and we learn at different pace. And um, the way we um, adapt and accept new information is very different. So I'll let them understand that, yes, we all, I as your teacher knows that it's difficult period for everyone. And, um, but keep doing what you're doing, make sure you keep doing your best. And um, don't just compare yourself with others. That's one, because when you do that and people are really going fast and then you're like way behind, you start feeling the pressure and that's where depression comes in, right? With that being said, that's my advice for the student. But I also have a role to play as um, an instructor. And what's the role? The role is understanding the student in your class, understanding which ones are like extremely good, the ones that they need more time to adjust, the ones that they need more time to process information and making accommodations to um, accept both of them, both classes of um, students. Um, I'm pretty much used to that. So um, I'm used to a class where you have some students that are extremely smart, they're doing very well. And then you have some students, they're kind of just tagging, tagging along, they're trying their best, but their best is always like taking them to maybe average of the class, right? So students like that, I organize more tutorials for them, spend more time with them, email them sometimes to tell them, hey, do you need any help? Um, if they submit assignment and they didn't get one, I still meet them and tell them, okay, um, do you need me to go over this thing? We could set up a meeting. Checking up the, on them regularly also helps. And then with that, they, they know that I care about them. And then they always put in their best and they are, they, they are they're keeping up with the top students. Okay. So I'm just thinking of um, future then, um, based on the, the students that you have, and we know that the, you know, COVID-19 has affected um, a lot of us in different ways. Yeah. Would you then say that we need to change the structure in terms of, you know, you know, normal degrees like three years, but obviously <laughs> some people have had to take a gap and then come back and yeah. it's no longer three years. That's no yeah. longer the norm. So would you, what advice do you have and what do you think would work best based on our current situation? And it's not changing if we're looking at it realistically currently. Okay where do you think the world is moving to when it comes to degrees and the, the you know the time frame I know you can take time off if you've got stress or you need time off and stuff but now it's the pandemic and then there's the stress from the pandemic and then there's other stresses as well that are on top of that and then there's the educational stress yep. so realistically what's your take on that well, um, my take, first of all, we all know that the world is moving towards online learning these days. Mm -hmm. um, lately, I've been receiving a lot of information about, oh, do you want to take another degree online? Like best university, most universities are even designing an entirely new degree online. Uh -huh. That's okay. Um, in my suggestion, I feel it very, very good. I mean, I also feel that uh, maybe the... HR, I mean, you're in HR, the HR should also, again, it depends on countries, right? Should also um, try and give people that, that did like open learning, distant learning or online degree, the same um, respect as the gift to people that actually took the class, the courses or the, the program in class. You get what I'm saying? If someone comes with that- I get what you're saying and yeah. I'm going to interject. No, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I was sense, waiting for you to do that, though. In the, in the sense of, if we look at gender right now, right? Okay. Men and women. Yeah. For how long must we fight for there to be equality? So it, that's like a similar debate. We know okay. that, you know, it, it should have the same respect. Yeah. But it's, it doesn't because of how things are viewed. 
Now, to change that, it's not HR, it's people <laughs> and the way they view the subject. So you're defending your, your profession now. Okay, I get that. I but, have um, we, we suffer a lot in HR. <laughs> <laughs> We well, get a I lot get of that. things that we're not qualified to do, but we have to get on with it. And this is not one of them. Sorry. Okay, I get your point, but this is a very controversial issue. But again, when someone is taking a degree, your choice of degree or your choice of program is depending on are you going to get a job after or yeah. are you taking it just to learn more, right? But if it's the later where you, you're thinking of job, we all know that someone that takes like a distance learning or online degree wouldn't be viewed as, as in the same manner as someone that actually attended the program in class. Mm -hmm. And then with this COVID things, there should be opportunities for people to say, okay, I don't want to mingle. I want to um, take all the program online. You get that. But then even though some people want to do it, they will still think, will I be viewed the same way? Will I get the same opportunities? Um, we might degree be respected. So if this barrier could be overcome a bit, cause you said it's people now, and we are the people, right? It's our opinion that matters. If this barrier could be overcome, and then they give people the choice to say, okay, I want to take this online, or okay, I want to come in person, then maybe um, we won't have a lot of students feeling um, depressed. A lot of students feeling, oh, I could stay in my city and take this class, right? Um, we won't have a lot of students um, committing suicide or something like that, right? Or having the tendency to say, okay, I want to commit suicide because it's really hard these days. They come to class nine to five with marks on, their face marks on. They don't, they can't, they, they have to sanitize their seats once they're gone. Um, it's just a lot of restrictions these days. Yeah. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. No, I, I do understand what, you're, what, what you, it is that you're conveying. And... I guess, you know, the, not challenge, the reality is, yeah. you know, if, for example, you have a postgraduate diploma, people okay. hear diploma and the reaction is like that. But it's up to you as individual to change the narrative in the sense of not take that on, but be realistic in terms of how you navigate to, to move on, you know, to the next path, be it career or still in education. Career, I mean, outside of education. So if you've studied online and you've got your um, PhD or your master's or your, you know, undergraduate, personally, I would like to say, you know, that shouldn't be a key barrier you know, that affects your emotions because it's still, the, the, the paper is the same. It's printed in the same place. Exactly. And, you know, the reality is you're competing with people who've got 10 years experience to get that job. Yeah. It's just that you don't have the experience, but most businesses don't look at your, your paperwork unless if you're trying to, to move abroad, then maybe that's when they will look at your certificates like that and, you know, and triple check. But I believe on the certificate, it doesn't say that you studied online. It's just a certificate to say you came, came out with the first. Is it distinction? Uh, merit, which is a second class. I don't know what, the, is it third class? I don't, third class. And I don't know. But, you know, you, you know what I mean <laughs> in terms of the grades. Um, so I don't think or maybe I am wrong and you need to educate me, but I would like to think that, you know, the certificate doesn't specify that you were learning in your bedroom. It's your skills and your knowledge that help you to get the role or help you to get the scholarship, mainly in terms of the paperwork. Or is that the theme that you're facing currently at the university where you are? And I've just gone off on a tangent. <laughs> No, no. Um, you're right, though. The certificate doesn't say that. You're right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really talking about the certificate. I'm talking about people's perception. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, but public perception. Um, I'm not talking about the certificate now. Okay. Let's, let's, let's flip it this way, right? Okay. If I worked as a, a kitchen porter, okay. right? And you didn't yeah. know. And I came in with my money and we went out for dinner and I paid the bill and you didn't know what I'd done. 
you wouldn't look at me like, oh, I, I think I should pay the bill because I get I earn more, right? Because you don't yep. know. So unless you tell people, right, and you announce yep. it, people don't look at you in a different manner. So if you've studied online, it's not an announcement that you need to spread around, you know? It's, it's not a hymn, <laughs> do you understand? Because you know how perception is. So your job is to say, I have a degree or I have an MSc or an MBA. If they say, how did you, that's none of your business. That's the university yeah. that I went to. Because you know how people perceive people. Like I said, back to gender, you know, I know I'm a woman, but I'm not going to walk in and be like, I'm a woman, I'm frail, treat me this way. Or I'm fighting for, you know, all the women. I don't know every woman out there and their struggles. I have to come in and be like, this is my experience. This is my expertise. You know, this is what I'm bringing to the table. I don't know if you yeah. understand what I'm saying. I understand that. It's a very interesting topic. Too. Okay. Now, one thing you should realize is this is very dependent on the country on okay. limitation okay like countries like nigeria's now they, they're definitely going to ask you before they hire you they're going to ask you which university do you go sometimes not all the times like yeah. i mean in your credentials you're going to list the university right yeah so um there's some university that that they take classes online in the country and i know that for sure probably it might have changed but um Sometimes there's still there's still this discrimination that okay, it's this university. Um, for you, right? Um, okay. I completely agree with you. Don't get me wrong. And okay. um, no, I think that's interesting what you've just said there. And you said in Nigeria, and I believe in Nigeria. When you finish, whether you studied abroad, you have to do that one year's um, worth of training into it for the government before you can commence with any kind exactly. of work. Yes. Yeah. So that's a different system altogether. So I feel yeah. like one umbrella does not fit all because the the system. That is what Nigeria, we're trying to say. Okay. That's what we're trying to say that <laughs> one umbrella does not fit all, right? Some countries experience this problem. Why some it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Um. So it also depends on the countries. So that's so what still, advice I, do you have for Nigerians then? Um. I feel that people hiring should just pay attention more to the person's capability, what you got out of the degree, what you learned and how you can demonstrate that instead of looking at what university or what medium of learning, you get what I'm saying? Uh -huh. uh, it's the same way everywhere. I don't know how it works, but I know in some countries, I'm not going to be specific. Sometimes yeah. they look at, okay, you went to the top university, you must be really good, give this person the job, yeah. you know? So instead of looking at that, why not look at what can this person do? What did this person get from the degree? Mm -hmm. What is this person bringing to my organization? You okay. know? So I'm not in HR, so I can't answer that question for you, but I could say for sure that, um, I mean, you know, you know better than I do because that's your field. But um, I've received my own fair of um, issues in that field where some people say, oh, you didn't go to the best school. Yeah. Um, we don't think you're qualified for this job, you know. So it happens. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I can't answer for HR completely. Yeah. But what I, I can say is, or what, what I will ask you to do is to educate businesses in Nigeria, um, you know, it's you, there's a huge population there, and we know that the ratio of poverty compared to the GDP, um, you know, is, there are some troubles there. So for anybody, because there are a lot of students who've gone abroad and have gone back to Nigeria, some of them have great yeah. jobs, and they're on Instagram, they show us life. And we've got other students who their parents took so many loans and because, you know, they're not really from an affluent background, they're, they're still struggling to, to gain employment, like you've just highlighted there. And, you know, be it HR or be it stereotype or culture, um, that also breeds challenges and religion breeds challenges, as we all know, and tribal stuff and are you from the north, the south, etc. We all know. So what advice do you have then for businesses that are looking for new talent 
and we know that um, you know in terms of culture when you're older you're known to know more when you're younger you're, you're meant to respect but you know the younger generation has a lot of innovation and they've got yeah. ideas that will enable the country to do better but it's sometimes it's not well received sometimes it is so what advice do you have as a young man that's gone through the education system and you know currently you're you're teaching and you you can see country where you came from yep. and you can see the challenges and you want to help the businesses to do better what advice do you have so with nigeria there are so many things to consider sometimes some people Won't you wanna be? <laughs> okay okay i'm coming to my advice though so <laughs> i do <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm just going to be straightforward in answering yeah. your question. Yeah. Um, so the first thing is, don't hire someone based on where the person is coming from. Mm -hmm. Either the person is Christian, Muslim, or the person is Igbo, Yoruba, or whatever. Just hire based on the, the person's ability to do the job. That's one. Mm -hmm. And two, this quota system in Nigeria for everything, sometimes they have quota for scholarships, Sometimes they have quota for jobs in federal institution. So this quota system drives me really, really crazy. Mm. Um, I'm sorry about the quota system, but I think it should stop. Okay. There shouldn't be a system where they say, oh, this is a state university. 80 to 90% of professors we're going to hire should be from that state. It shouldn't be like that. We are all Nigerians, right? Mm. Um, quota system of hiring should stop. And going back to small businesses. Um, small businesses should be about empower, like empowering the community, you know? So um, the small businesses should um, create a system where they could extract raw talent from the community, irrespective of their academic degree. Some people didn't even go to school in Nigeria and they are extremely talented. Let's say in IT, they learned by YouTube videos and everything. But still, some jobs will be asking for, you have to have a degree in. No, they should hire based on what the person can do mm -hmm. and not the degree. And there's another thing that I should tell you that drives me crazy in Nigeria is the fact that they're going to tell you that, okay, this job is for someone that is 30 years old maximum with 15 years experience, for example. So did they expect you to start working at 15 years to get that 15 years experience? <laughs> yeah, some do, I'm, I might be exaggerating, but this is true. You might be surprised, but this is very, very true. Search my soul then, I had to calculate. Yeah, but... yeah, they, they can, yeah it's true. They can say, okay, you must not, to, to get this job, you must not be more than, let's say, 30 years old, and you must have had maybe 10 to 15 years experience. How do they expect you to do that when you would finish your university at 23 or 24? Then how do they expect? So it's kind of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I believe every job advert should be checked meticulously. Yeah. To make sure that if you're not asking for ridiculous experience, you know, mm -hmm. um, and this is true. You could check some job advert and you'd be like, oh my God, where, how on earth did they expect to find that kind of person? You know, um, so this is a systematic problem. Yeah. Um, a problem that it's not just, it didn't just start today. I've been through the system. I experienced something like that. But the good thing is, Many multinationals in Nigeria, they've been able to deviate from that system. They, they hire people based on merit, like KPMG, for yeah, instance. Obviously. This, you're not this religion, you know, this kind of system. This, you're not my brother or sister, I can't give you the job. So this has to change. Mm. No, I mean, very insightful. And I think it's learnings for HR, but I think there's a lot more to it. It's not just HR because a yeah. business isn't run by HR, effectively yeah, run right. by people and traditions, as we know, and religion, as you've touched on, on that, it can be challenging. But to close off um, our discussion today, what advice do you have um, in terms of somebody who's just finished and they're looking up to you and probably i'm sorry to go back to nigeria um they're thinking i want to do a postdoc and i want to you know to teach as well i want to be a professor and yep. i'm not sure what to do if i stay in nigeria and teach in nigeria maybe i may not be able to 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 get to where i want to be i want yep. to move abroad and you know do something that i enjoy and currently my situation doesn't help me. 
what advice do you have? Okay, this is a very good question and thanks for asking this question because um, I've lately I've received more than six to seven people from Nigeria that just finished their PhD in Nigeria and they're looking at getting a postdoc abroad and they've asked me the same question you're asking me now, what advice do I have for them? And mm -hmm. I'm gonna just tell you the same thing I tell them. Number one is um, when it comes to getting postdoc, your mm -hmm. publication record matters a lot. Okay. And not just publishing in predatory journals, I mean, to high journals in your field. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, most of the people that contacted me, they either have one or two publications and they are not even like top journal. They are like all these predatory journals, right? Mm -hmm. So I tell them, um, your PhD might be good, but if you don't have that publication record, look for people, top professors in your field um that are doing something similar to a PhD message them and ask if you could work for them maybe collaborate with them to publish more papers in a top journal right so um after you do that that's one the second thing is look for um PhD fellowship or sorry postdoc fellowship in Nigeria and abroad that you could apply for the fellowship that involves for example, now the Mary Curie Fellowship involves a series of professional development and training. So that one, your publication record might not matter. But if you have a strong resume, you can get it, then you can go abroad where they will train you for that two years to get the required skill needed to become um, a professor where you want to go. That's the second one. And the third one is don't just sit and do nothing. Look for universities in Nigeria where you can apply to and work. Um, you could apply to get teaching experience, it helps a lot. You could even look for top professors there and do research with them and get more paper published, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the third one they could do. Um, the other thing I also tell them is um, make sure you are active on LinkedIn. Um, checking top professors' profile, messaging them personally, because most of the postdoc opportunity, mm -hmm. they are mostly unsolicited conversation that leads to oh yeah you come and work for me maybe you might be lucky to find someone um on linkedin and you message them you say you finished your um phd in this field but you don't have enough experience but however you're willing to learn mm -hmm. and then um, you're very determined if you give me this postdoc opportunity um i'm going to do my best to um, meet the deliverables right mm -hmm. that would also work on linkedin then also um, sending um, unsolicited emails also to professors, uh, outlining your experience and expertise mm -hmm. and what you bring to their research group. So there is no two way about this. These are the advice I give to them. And to round it up, I tell them professional development is important. Yeah. Make sure you are improving yourself. There are so many online classes or courses these days that are even free. So mm -hmm. make sure you take as many as possible. Don't just take them for the certificate. Most times when I take classes online, I don't care about the certificate. In the end, I just care about what did I get out of this class? Yeah. It's my three hours wasted. Make sure you keep improving, keep learning, because these skills, as a PhD holder, people expect us to know so many things. Mm -hmm. But they don't know that we only did PhD in a particular field, right? Yeah. So they feel like, okay, you are a doctor now, you know everything. Mm -hmm. So at least don't just go into a meeting and be blank. Make sure you are always learning to improve yourself. So that's the advice I have. <laughs> wow. I mean, those are insightful words. And I think they will work for anybody that's coming from a third world country, essentially. Um, you could be from Cambodia, it will work for you, Brazil, you know, South Africa, Angola, to name a few countries. And I think what you said is essential and it's something that I've come to learn that if I don't publish in the essential, um, you know, publications, <laughs> I may not have a job, <laughs> which is a hard pill to swallow because, you, you know, you're thinking, oh, I've done great, but no, you need to publish in the right, you know, publications yep. um, according to the institutions that we want to work in. So we have to adhere to that. So thank you so much um, for your time today, Dr. Jude Akali. And I know I say it wrong, but hey, it is what it is. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you for you. your time. Elevated. Now it's my time to shine. Yeah, let's go.